Matthew chapter 10. Really wanted to read the whole chapter. If it was Zim, was going to read the whole chapter. <laughs> because we all have time. So I'm going to read from verse 5 to, to, 20, to 23, Matthew chapter 10. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying. Give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts. No beg for your journey or two tunics or centrals or a staff for the laborers deserve his food. And whatever you town, whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen your words, shake off the dust of your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of the wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogue. And you will be dragged before, government, before governors and kings for my sake to be a witness before them and the Gentiles. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Treble winners! I only know one person here at KCC who follows soccer. I don't know about others. <laughs> and I'm not going to mention him, his name, for security reasons. <laughs> Manchester City won Champions League, FA Cup, and the Premier League. They have become the first English Premier League club since Manchester United to win a treble of all three major trophies in one season. They won their first ever Champions League and a treble after a 1-0 win over Inter Milan. They outpaced closest rivals Arsenal to comfortably win the Premier League and they beat fierce rivals Manchester United in the FA Cup final. City has become the first English Premier League club since Manchester United to win a treble of all three major trophies in one season. The club has risen to become the dominant force in the English game, having won seven Premier League titles in the past 12 years and five of the last six. Whether the noise neighbors like it or not, the force is irresistible to the extent that even those who follow rugby only starting to get the feel that there is a team in England called Manchester City. 
this is what happens when a team is playing its game well. It starts to gain more supporters, new recruits. The owner, Monsu, is on a mission. A mission to build the team's legacy. Let's pause on this. We'll come back to it later as we weep over us now who always find themselves, always find themselves lead, lead the league alphabetically. I wonder what comes to your mind when you hear the word missions. Mission. Missions. What is mission? From the Church Missionary Society definition, mission is to articulate and demonstrate the news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just do a contrast with what evangelism is. Evangelism has to do with the proclamation of the gospel of the good news to the world with the aim of persuading people to come to faith and be reconciled with God. I don't think we could see the difference between these two definitions. Mission is an umbrella word. The term mission is something broader that speaks about the comprehensive relationship that God's people have to the world which evangelism is actually a very critical component. But mission is broader than just articulating the good news of Jesus. It's also service that should be carried out by Christians in their radical transformed lives, showing people how it looks like to be reconciled to God, how it looks like to be reconciled to other people. Mission is showing people how does it look like to be liberated from the bondage of sin, not just telling people about it. It is showing people how we do things differently. And mission is compromised. If you ever think it is one of those things is the only thing you need to do for you to go on a mission. Matthew's gospel closes by telling the disciples that, it closes by showing us Jesus telling his disciples to go out into the world as his representatives to make disciples of all nations. Jesus don't say to them, go into the world, tell people to say a repentance prayer, then it's done. Dear friends, to ignore what mission is all about as a church is to be ineffective as a church. And so maybe that's why KCC have something they call missions committee. Maybe they are trying to conscientize us. They are trying to remind us to all think more seriously about missions. And today we are looking at chapter 10, which is a key transition point in Matthew's gospel. I can summarize this chapter, this passage, by one single word, mission. God's people are on a mission. If you look at how Man City were buying players, you can tell that these guys really wanted to win Champions League. Erling Haaland grabbed the headlines for his 52 goal hole in debut season. That included setting a single-season Premier League record of 36 goals. But City's brilliance comes from a collective effort. Rodri was the unlikely goal-scoring hero against Inder Melin, and City needed goalkeeper Ederson to produce a series of important saves to conquer Europe for the first time in their history. It's a collective effort. Which number are you playing? There are three things. Let's go for it. Time. There are three things 
that we're going to learn from this passage. The first thing, the power of God's mission. The second, the danger of God's mission. And then the third, the love of God's missions. I think you got the line, you got the road that you're going to take. If you paraphrase Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 to 8, missions is introduced to you. The team is picked, identified, verse 1 to 5 of chapter 10. The power, the authority is delegated to the team, verse 8. The parameter of the mission field is set up, verse 5 and 6. Not to go outside Israel and what to say, what to do, and what to take is also outlined, verse 7 to 8. Not to take stuff from people. It's amazing at this point to see how Jesus' mission is fused into the disciples. The disciples are given the authority of Jesus to do his mission. In fact, the word disciple and apostle were almost interchangeably terms at this point. Although it sounds quite religious these days, uh, Apostle Mike. In Zimbabwe, they like it. They are giving themselves these titles. Originally, the word, the word apostle at this point, it was used to describe merchantship. That is someone sent off to complete some sort of human enterprise and bring back goods. Some, someone dealing with foreign countries. It was where we get the word voyage from nowadays. I'm sure uh, a nomad can help to translate these things. He's a translator. Long journey, heading off a traveler. The power of missions in this sense is realized in the sense that you have been sent by Jesus on his behalf. As the Father sent me, so I send you, says Jesus in John's gospel. What you got here is God thinking globally and acting locally. When he sends Jesus into the Middle East to begin a mission to the world, and at that point, to save all humanity. Now, he thinks locally and acts globally. As he sent his disciples out on a mission, and the pattern keeps on repeating itself until today, that somebody preaches to you, and you responded, and you are the legacy of that. In its simplest way, the word apostle simply means the send one. To emphasize that God's mission is not our mission, it's his mission. We just the send ones. It's a privilege to represent God, dear friends. And Jesus says, of you, speak on my behalf, I will speak to the Father on your behalf. That's how close this relationship is. You look at verse 33. And in verse 25 of our passage, Jesus is saying, if people fail to respect him, and then it means they are not going to respect any of his family members and his kingship and his headship, that identification with Jesus power have far-reaching implications. Jesus sort of unpacked this. If you look at verse 32 uh, to 33 of chapter 10, when he talks about what it looked like now and what will it look like then. He says, identifies with Jesus now before people and Jesus will identify with you before God then. If you disown Jesus before people now, Jesus will disown you before the Father then. And verse 32, those who receive Jesus and those who receive people sent by Jesus effectively receives Jesus himself. That's how powerful God's mission is. That's how those two things fused together. Ultimately, 
Jesus' mission is a true identification with Jesus. It's not good enough, dear friends, dear KCC family, it is not good enough to just think of Jesus as the nice person, as the powerful guy. Yeah, you know, this, he was a good guy. No, you have to be fused with his mission. His mission must merge with your own mission. Jesus, he sends his disciples out. He did not save them and say, now you are sorted. Go and enjoy your dreams. He did not leave people where they were. Remember, they were by the lake of Galilee, bees casting their nets. He did not leave people in their offices, in their classrooms, in their cars, in their houses. They become sent ones from the day one on. You are the sent ones, dear friends. And you have been sent by Jesus to that person next to you. Ask yourself, where did God put me? Where did God send you? Are you the sent one? You are being set apart by God to that specific person. Whether it's in construction, Ben, whether it's high school, I don't know if Chris is still high school. I think it's uni now. Whether it's KCC, Mike. Whether it's in Zimbabwe, Nelson. Whether it's Masipumelele, Tabo. Whether it's in New Zealand, Sunita and Ajayin. Whether it's in Mozambique, Nomad. You are the saint one. You have, to tell, you have to think about this in that radical way of transformation. Don't worry if they reject you. Because it's not you they are rejecting. It's Jesus they are rejecting. That's how fascinating God's mission is, dear friends. Oh, let's go to the second point. We are done with the first one, the power of mission. Let's go to the dangers, the struggles of God's missions. What are the dangers of missions? The dangers are going to be painful, dear friends. <laughs> so much so Jesus pictures them like sending sheep out among wolves. They are going into an environment full of predators. Look with me at verse 16. So Jesus is blowing off any bubbles that you may think mission is going for a walk by the beach. Is, you might think our mission is blowing off those bubbles. It's not a committee made up of color, Kathy and Mike, they will sort out things for us. Easy. Missions is difficult and it is complex. It brings the with worries of provisions and fearful of hostility and painful disruptions of relationships. What you are going to eat, fear of hostility and straining relationships. And anyone who thinks that being Jesus' representatives is going to be life of flaw. They haven't listened to Jesus long enough because Jesus himself says it's going to be messy. It will be messy for your life. It's going to be messy, very messy, like a teenager's bedroom. <laughs> it will be messy for your life. In verses 9 and 10, the disciples are told to pack and go the opposite direction which our families go on holidays. That's actually a different picture with what we do when we go on our holidays. We take everything, aren't we? But Jesus says here, pack nothing, travel light. On our way here, our friend who dropped us at the airport, when she saw our bags, she was surprised and she said to Tatenda, is that all you have? <laughs> and when Andrea, who was welcoming us home, he says something similar. He said, is that all you guys have? And I said, yes. Travel light. And maybe for us, it was a forced travel light. What would you carry from Zimbabwe? It should be the other way around. Maybe check our bags on our way back. <laughs> Travel light. 
they almost go as they are. The iron here is that the only possible reason, therefore, is that God is going to supply what they needed. In verse 10, look at verse 10. No beg for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff. God is going to supply food and shelter. The most basic needs will be met by those who welcome them along the way. Jesus says in verse 10, for the laborer deserves his food. A good lesson of depending on God when reaching out. They can really, they can rely on God to meet their needs through others, but not only food and shelter, even the very words to say before the rulers of their day. He says it in verse 9, if you are with me. Verse 19 and verse 20, sorry. He says, don't be intimidated because at that very point, you'll be given words to say by the Holy Spirit. Mike was introducing me like, Nelson, he's still skinny. <laughs> For me, it was very daunting to knock the doors of the principles. Remember, it's a state-controlled nation in Zimbabwe. Introducing focus to the principle. It was very daunting looking at my face, single young man, what do you want to do with our students here? And then he throws the most catastrophic issue about missions. He goes, look at verse 22. Uh, to 23. There will be persecution. Why this is going to happen, verse 22, is going to happen because you have carried the very words and name of Jesus. It's going to happen because you have identified with Jesus. In AD 70, Jewish Christians left Jerusalem in response to persecution. You can read about it in the book of Acts. And from then on until Constantine, Christians who were on a mission, they expected that the minority can actually influence the majority. It's possible. History has a culture of repeating itself because I think the hardest thing to do today is to be a Christian in high school, at university, or at work. The difficult thing to do today is to be a Christian on campus. Kids talking about going to Sunday school, that's not common anymore. You are actually really weird. You are strange if you talk about Christianity. If you're a teenager, he, what are you talking about? Well, friends, we have option here. You can fear, we can fear the hostility, hostility or we can follow Jesus' instructions in verse 28, which says to us, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who kill the soul and throw it into hell. The persecutors may be, they can terminate physical life, the bodies, but they can't touch life, the soul that Dr. Smango talked about last week. There are more valued fears than those who persecute you, more valued fears than poverty. Reconciling sinful wayward people to the holy God is going to be be a very destructive and dangerous and messy and a hostile thing for you to do in this world. But what brings the greatest anguish is when persecution is coming from the very people you don't expect. Your family. Look at verse 34 and 36 with me. The anguish, I'm not going to read it, the anguish of missions is that sometimes it comes from places where we normally look for love and comfort. And that is painful possibility. That if you decide to enter into Jesus' mission. But the fact that you are a Christian, it means you have decided already. You are already in the mission. That it might end up breaking some of the closest relationship you have in your life. God's mission, dear friends, brings huge disruptions and enmity between close friends rather than love and peace. God's mission is costly. It cost his disciples 
everything they had. Because mission cost the father everything he had. His only begotten son, the one he loves. Let me ask you, when it comes to Christianity, are you into God's vision or into his provision? Are you part of God's great plan to redeem his people or are you looking for God to support you and to fit into the plans you have for your life? Or probably, to put it bluntly, do you want Jesus to lead you or do you want Jesus to just feed you? I don't want to leave this place disheartening the hearts of people about missions. Let me end my talk with the last point. The love, the blessings, the hope of missions. I don't know if you have noticed the emotions in this chapter. That there is a fear of shame, struggles, or challenges involved in missions. Danger. There is worry. Here, I think ladies have to listen carefully. There are lots of emotions here. There is, you know, there's danger. There's worry. But there's also one emotion that rises above all other emotions. Sort of like signature to all other emotions. That emotion is kind of the signature of them all. It is love. Love that will drive us all into missions. Love that drives missions forward. Firstly, the love that God has for those he sends into his missions. Look at verse 29 to 39. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall into the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. What a love. So don't be afraid. You are worthy more than sparrows because you are a sent one in this world. It is right, yes, to be afraid of what's going to happen to your family, to you, if you decide to be a sent one. It's understandable. But Jesus reminds us of our infinity worthy to the Father. God's power will preserve us for eternity. And that contrast with what people can do to us in here and now. The limits that are placed on them on how much they can touch. They can't touch your soul. If you are in God's vision, God is concerned about every detail of his sent ones. God is not surprised with the details of where you are going, what to say and eat. He knows those details. That's how much he loved you. Secondly, the love is a two-way street. Verse 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worth of me. And I know many people are not coming to church because they love their children who go on, on Sunday for sports. Anyone who loves his daughter or son more than me is not worth of me, says Jesus. The affections we have must be high. Jesus says that even those who are nearest or dearest to us, even closest of human lives, can be compared to the love he has to us. So those who are sent ones into God's missions must love Jesus before anything else as though themselves are loved by Jesus. Finally, dear friends, that love will also drive us into out outstanding compassion for the people we are being sent to. Jesus says it in verse 6. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The image that he already alluded in chapter 9, verse 36, the context of our passage. When Jesus, look at verse 36 of chapter 9, when Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and hopeless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus presents an image that shows us that he is not going for mission because he is feeling guilty. Especially after Nelson's sermon. No! He, 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 is, he, he is 
the thing that is motivating him is not guilty, but it's compassion. When he looks at God's people, he sees little fat sheep because this is what happens to sheep. Sheep are incredible animals, helpless animals. They are not gods. If you know gods, you know gods, I grew up in the rural area. God can put his head in the pot, but sheep can't do it. Because it can pull off its, itself off its chain. It can go anywhere. It can do anything for itself. But sheep are not like that. Sheep are hopeless. They are, not, they are not like gods. They are open to predators. They can be wounded easily. They are helpless. What more? That one without a shepherd. It means they are worse vulnerable and are in great danger. That's what none believers look like to Jesus. And when he saw that, he is moved in his gut, something deep into his heart about them. Perhaps we don't care. Perhaps we don't go. Perhaps we don't reach out because we don't see the way Jesus sees. Can we see what Jesus sees? He sees a true condition of humanity. Was in pick and pay on Wednesday. Everyone was not smiling. I did not see anyone smiling. They look somber. They are in their own world. Think for a moment on people you work alongside with. Think of people you cherish in your family. Think of people you waved over to over the fence or Jurao. Think of your classmates. Think of people you sit next to in a train. Can you see their true condition? Can you see what Jesus sees in Matthew chapter 9, verse 6? Harassed by pressure, harassed by false prosperity preachers, our modern day Pharisees. Hungry for something, they can't seem to be satisfying. Running for money, women, miracles, Facebook, Instagram, sending letters that seem to go nowhere, throwing CVs everywhere but no responses, exhausted by their work, shopping till they drop, renovating like this earth is their home, seeking pleasure for the best food, the best holidays, the best clothes, People are harassed. They are helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Do you see the way Jesus sees? If you do, you don't need to be reminded to go on a mission. Jesus' mission is pumped by love, and it changes both people who are sent as well as people that they are sent to. Let me challenge you this morning. Keep looking at people the way that Jesus does. Don't stop doing that. Know the right things to fear in life. If you are currently counting the cost, take courage because what happened to you has happened to other Christians for centuries. The power of missions lying in knowing that you have been sent and you have been identified in this mission and is as this Jesus is with you. Realistically, it will be difficult and this mission you are involved into will be motivated by love. Love Jesus, love those you are sent to. Let me close by reading this verse to you. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 16. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in whom of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach? unless they are sent. Where do you fit? That word that you brought this morning, and thank you. I should say Nelson Vukani. Thank you. We, uh, we may the Lord truly minister to our hearts and convict us by his spirit. Amen. We're going to ask Daniel to come and lead us as we close. Uh, please do stay for some tea and coffee after.
Mark and Lori 